In our last episode, we stole a priceless necklace from Darren Hightower in order to join the Thieves Guild run by a thief named Loxley. And we finally dealt with Decker, the crime boss of the Hub Underground operating out of the Maltese Falcon. We also met a cult called the Church of the Cathedral. Their top representative here in the hub was High Priestess Jane, who had a singularly unpleasant personality, so much so that she became hostile and attacked if we dared insult her faith. We sadly had to dispatch her, but while doing so, we learned a bit more about the children of the cathedral and learned that they worship a being called the Holy Flame, who operates out of a brick-and-mortar cathedral somewhere to the south. The hub is certainly giving up its mysteries, but the final mystery is to discover what on earth is going on with all of these missing caravans. Now, so far we've learned that every caravan company here at the hub has had at least one caravan go missing, but none of them have been hit harder than the Fargo traders. They have lost so many caravans that Butch, the leader of the Fargo traders, has launched his own investigation. We read a sandwich board in the middle of the merchant marketplace saying that the Fargo traders were looking for caravan guards and other people who may be interested in solving mysteries. And so to the far northern corner of the merchant marketplace we go. Here we find the Fargo traders. As soon as we enter, Ian shares his thoughts. He's clearly been here before. Fargo traders run by Butch Harris. He's Atne Ute Aitbre, if you catch my meaning. Well, looks like Pig Latin is alive and well in the post-apocalypse. Heading inside, we don't see Butch. Instead, we find Rutger, who's guarding the door to a back room. Hello, says Rutger, and welcome to the Fargo traders. How may we help you? We can ask him if the Fargo traders transport water. After all, our primary purpose for being here is to find a missing water chip for our vault. But perhaps we can bypass this altogether by instead shipping water to our vault. Rutger initially expresses interest for a prize, but when we tell him we need enough water for an entire vault, he says, are you nuts? We don't have access to that much water. But on top of that, he doesn't want to go into the mountains because of all of the recent missing caravans. Instead, he recommends that we check out the water merchants, whom we can find in the southern spoke of the hub. We'll be sure to check in with them, but before we do, we can ask Rutger here more about the missing caravans. From the dialogue, we gather that Rutger is really the man in charge of Fargo Traders. He runs the day-to-day -day operations of the caravan company. He facilitates trades between a wide range of settlements here in the wasteland, and he trades in all sorts of stuff. Chems, tires, guns, bullets, food, brahma, dirt, even scraps of metal. You'd be surprised what's in demand out there, he says. Something that may be taken for granted here may be a highly sought-after commodity in a settlement ten miles away. But before he can give us the okay to work for him, we do have to have an audience with Butch, who is at least a figurehead of the Fargo traders. What do you want? I need to ask you some questions. Time is money, chit-chat is not money. You hear about the job or what? Yes. Hot damn, someone with guts. Done and done. Go talk with my second, Rutger, and get the details. Wait, wait, wait. I have some questions about the job first. <sighs> Don't spoil it. Make them quick. How much does it pay? Uh, Rutger will handle that. Uh, he does all the trivial stuff for the Fargo traders. Now get on out, because I got work to do. Trivial, like how much to pay the people doing work for your company, right. Looks like Rutger really is in charge. Hey, I've got one more question, okay? Just one. Can you tell me more about this job? Well, some caravans have been disappearing on us lately. Damn if anyone can figure out what happened to them. I bet you didn't even look for them. Uh, what did you say? I was implying that you were too frightened to go look for them. I'm tired of your insults, you... You pinhead! Don't come back! Rutger, take this annoying bug away! If we choose that option, we get locked out of further dialogue with the guy, though we can always take the job again from Rutger. But assuming we didn't defend Butch here, we can ask him, so what do you want me to do? Simple. Find out who's doing it and tell me. Or take him out. Makes no damn difference to me. Just get that job done. Oh golly, that sounds scary. I'd better pass. Then what the hell am I doing still looking at you? Get out. Or we can say, do you have any clues about who's doing this? 
Well, there's, uh, <clears throat> something, but I never listen to those rumors. Well, I do. What is it? You, uh, you really want to hear it, huh? Well, some say it's the Death Claw, but, but I don't know nothing about that. You sound scared, Butch. Listen, you, I ain't scared. I'm cautious. You'd be stupid not to be, with the Death Claw. Look, go talk to Beth, she'll tell you more. Well, what else is around here besides the hub? Yeah, just the normal stuff. Well, you got the Junk Town to the north, and the Brotherhood of Steel to the northwest, and of course the Boneyard to the south. All right, two more locations added to our map. The Brotherhood of Steel to the northwest, and the Boneyard to the south. Hey, Butch, can you tell me about yourself? Hmm, what do you want to know? Just curious. Yeah, well, I don't like going around talking about my personal life and such. Oh, come on. Please? Well, I've run the Fargo Traders for about five years. Before that, I was in Aditum. Before that, near the Glow. And with that, we get the Glow and the Los Angeles Boneyard of Aditum added to our map. Well, uh, what was I supposed to do again? Well, you're a bright one, ain't you? Here's the job. Find out who's stealing my caravan's money. Big. You fail, hurt, big. Understand? Now get out of here. After talking with Butch, we can check in with Rutger to learn something useful about this job. He tells us that the job pays 500 hub bucks, but only if we can tell Butch exactly what's been happening to all of his missing caravans. In order to do so, we'll have to collect and show him some proof. Rutger has a hunch that the water merchants are somehow sabotaging the Fargo traders caravans. But then he goes on to say that it may be the Brotherhood of Steel. But we have already learned that all of the caravan companies have at least one missing caravan. It would be strange for the water merchants to attack themselves too. Could he be right about this Brotherhood of Steel? Or is Butch right about this Death Claw? If we ask Rutger more about the Brotherhood of Steel, he tells us that they're really strange. They worship technology, and they wield a whole lot of firepower. He suspects them mainly because they could very easily take out an entire caravan, and then he tells us where we can find them. When we ask him about the Death Claw, he pretty much dismisses it. He says, yeah, Death Claw, whatever. It's just people's imagination getting carried away. There's no ghost or monster or whatever it's supposed to be. Just stick with reality and you'll be fine. Despite this, he says that if we want to learn more, we can talk with Beth about it in the gun shop. And we recall that when we last talked with Beth, she offered us a 15% discount if we ever decided to work with the Fargo traders. Well, now that we're gainfully employed, we can head on over to the gun shop to take advantage of this discount. And we can ask her what she knows about the missing caravans. She acknowledges the rumor that the water merchants may be responsible, but she dismisses it. And she thinks that the Death Claw is more likely, though she does concede that the Brotherhood of Steel are certainly a viable option. When we ask her why it couldn't be the water merchants, she says that it's because they've lost a few caravans too. Not nearly as many as the Fargo traders, but they have been affected as well. Why would they harm their own caravans? We can suggest that this is all part of their plan. They could be lying about their missing caravans to remove suspicion from themselves. But Beth doesn't buy it because even though the water merchants and the other caravans do sabotage each other on a regular basis, completely destroying entire caravans and killing the caravans caravan guards is not really their style. Plus, that costs money. And she doesn't think that the water merchants would spend that kind of money to take out an entire caravan and effectively make them disappear. After all, every caravan is heavily guarded. She says you'd think someone would escape. But no, every single time, they completely vanish altogether. She then says that she thinks the Fargo traders have been affected more than the others simply due to bad luck, or perhaps because they're traveling the wrong routes. Routes that may lead them closer towards something dangerous. We can then ask her about the Death Claw. What exactly is a Death Claw? And she tells us that the Death Claw is the most evil thing to rise out of the ashes after the war. Some say it's a powerful ghost from the war that haunts the land. But Beth says that it's no ghost. It's flesh and blood, as real as you and I. It's 20 feet tall, with 
teeth as big as your arm. It's some kind of demon that found its way here when the world was engulfed in fire. <clears throat> <laughs> we can respond a number of ways, all of which make her angry and causes her to not talk with us anymore. We can say, uh, sorry I asked, or you're crazy, I should just end your misery right here and now. But to actually get her to talk more about it, we can say, wow, do you know where it is? Or do you know anything more about the Death Claw? And she says, well, I know this old mutant in Old Town named Harold. He has seen it. He's the only one who has seen it and lived. When we ask her how she knows that Harold is the only one to have seen the Deathclaw, she says, well, Uncle Slappy over in Old Town talks about it sometimes, but he's just a crazy old fool. Well, maybe, but perhaps we can get something out of Uncle Slappy. Before we head to Old Town, we can ask her what she thinks about the Brotherhood of Steel. And immediately she begins to whisper. Why, don't you know, she says. I heard that they make human sacrifices and do all sorts of other terrible things. You never know what a person's really like behind closed doors. You've got to be careful with whom you associate. After we've indulged in Beth's gossip, we can head over to Old Town to see if we can find Harold and Uncle Slappy. If we head due west of the L-shaped building, where we found the basement that concealed the Thieves' Circle, we find an unremarkable rectangular wreck. And outside the door, a man wandering around saying, Do, do, do. He has a lot of nonsensical things to say here. Where's my blanket? Let's play Global Thermonuclear War, which I believe is a reference to war games. Give me the sugar, baby. It's a bitty spider, smashin', smashin'. The moon is out there. This is Uncle Slappy, and he's a few pennies short of a dollar. Or a few caps short of a six-pack? Oh, pretty, pretty stuff. Why is the moon? We can ask him what he does around here, and he says, Do, I do, then you do, then we all do. No, really, what do you do? I do this, then I do that. You see Harold? Harold's fun. His hair falls out. Falls in the wind. There it goes. Wind. Wind. What is your problem? Problems are like soup bowls. Wide and shallow. We could try to focus this guy and say, Beth told me to talk with you about the Death Claw. Beth, Beth, Shusha, Beth. Like Harold, you talk, Harold. Harold tell you story. Slappy help, then. Right. Heading inside the shack, we find the first room empty, but upon entering the second room, we find... Spare change, old friend, old pal. Can you help a poor mutant down on his luck? <coughs> oh, it's a hideous mutant! Keep away from me! You're as bad as the rest of them. <coughs> When we've regained our composure after seeing such a mutant, we can try to talk with him again. It doesn't matter whether we give him money or tell him to shove off. He'll talk with us the same. Though if we don't have enough money to give him, he says, Jeez, you're worse off than I am, friend. Look to you. What's your story, Harold? The whole thing? Well, now... After the Great War, my vault was one of the first to open. <sighs> Phew. Long time. No, no, I meant what happened to change you into... that? I got mutated. Sure wasn't born this ugly. Happened when we tried to find out where all the mutants were coming from. Oh, you remember the Great War? Tell me about those times. All started with the sirens. I was young, but oh, I do remember that. A lot of terrible years followed. And I remember walking out of the vault late one morning. Where was your vault located? You know, <coughs> I'm not real sure anymore. West, I think. Oh, wait, uh, east? Oh, I don't know. I... <coughs> do you realize how old that makes you? Yeah, about a century or two in dog years. Dog what? Ah, uh, never mind. That was from my time. I'm cranky old and I've been that way ever since I changed. 
Now, we don't know for sure, but it's likely that Harold came from Vault 29. Now, Vault 29 is never mentioned in any published game. However, the entire story of Vault 29 was written for the game that was to be Fallout 3 before Black Isle Studios cancelled it. In that game, we learned that the vault that Harold came from was Vault 29. Vault 29 was a vault filled only with children. On the day of Armageddon, their parents were separated from them, although some design specs for the vault mentioned that some adults were allowed, but only if they were terminally ill and likely to die soon. Regardless, only a few years after the bombs dropped, the vault was filled only with children. The children were then raised by robots of the vault, who raised them by only teaching them tribal knowledge from humanity's past. vault -Tec's experiment was to see how a group of people who had no memory or record of the technological advances of humanity would survive in a post-apocalyptic wasteland. However, vault experiment was thwarted. A woman named Diana, who before the war had merged with a computer, took over the robots of Vault 29 and kept the vault doors from opening. In so doing, she allowed the children to grow up and then have their own children. Many generations passed in Vault 29, and during that time, Diana sent robots out into the wasteland to create a city for the descendants of Vault 29 to live. On the fateful day when she opened the doors, the residents of Vault 29 emerged to find a new home built for themselves, and here they established a tribe called the Twin Mothers. The Twin Mothers was a matriarchal society, and the only reason I mention it here is because the Twin Mothers are canon. The Twin Mothers were mentioned by Ulysses during the Lonesome Road DLC. Mojave's got ways of healing most ills. If not... Some tribes are usually found a way you didn't expect, like healing powders. Tribes back west only use Xander and rock flower. There's a way the twin mothers in the east used to brew it, though. Cures a wound, leaves the bitterness that caused it. The twin mothers were always about lessons. Kaisar taught them the last one, though. So that's it for them. Though tragically, their fate is also set in stone. The Twin Mothers were eventually consumed by the Legion. Harold was born in 2072, making him only five years old when the nuclear apocalypse happened in 2077. He was one of the children who grew up in Vault 29. But in the year 2090, the robots of Vault 29 removed him from the vault by force under the pretense of sending him out into the wasteland to see if it was ready for habitation. But he would never return to Vault 29. This was all part of Diana's plot to convince the residents of Vault 29 that the wasteland was not yet suitable for reclamation, which encouraged them to stay within the safety of Vault 29. Harold was taken to Diana, and Diana gave him the option to either stay with her forever or leave Vault 29 to explore the wasteland. However, if he chose to leave and wander the wasteland, he would be conditioned before he left so that he wouldn't remember where he came from, thus protecting the location of Vault 29. He chose to stay with Diana, but he escaped. He chose to keep the existence of Diana and Vault 29 a secret, even after everything she did to him, because he didn't want any harm to come to them. And so he wandered the wasteland. We can then ask him what he did after he left his vault. Well, I was a traitor. Did pretty good making a circuit between survivors. Lost a lot of good people, though. <coughs> How did you lose so many people? <sighs> Gangers got them. Scavengers attacking the caravans and mutant son of a dog if they weren't springing up like rabbits with a mission. <coughs> Had to have an army of guards with just to do a deal. Didn't the guards help? Of course they helped, you bonehead. Just too damn many to handle. How did you survive the mutant attacks? Didn't. Got killed. <laughs> Love that joke. <laughs> Funny, Harold. Such a joker. Well, did you ever find out where the mutants were coming from? Everywhere. Hell, seemed like you couldn't fart without hitting one. But mostly in the Northwest. You farted to the Northwest? <laughs> Pretty good. No. <laughs> well, why didn't you just avoid that area? Needed to see what was there. Maybe stop whatever was churning them boogers out. We thought we were prepared. Were we wrong? 
What did you do? We mounted an expedition. God, Richard. Richard Gray led a small group of us up there. Where did you go? I can't remember the route or anything, but I am damn sure it was northwest, though. I think. Who's Richard Gray? Richard Gray was a doctor. A little older than me, and Fran was he smart. He found the source. And what was that? Some sort of old military base. We lost a lot of folks getting in there. But how did you know that the base was the source of the mutants? Because it was like someone went bargain shopping at Mutant Land. Whee, cheaper by the dozens. Can't figure any other reason except that being the factory. What did you find in the military base? Robots and such. A lot of them. Damn surprised they were still running after all this time. What with the war and all. Whew, boy, they tore us a good one. What did you do when you got past the robots? We got pretty far inside. Wasn't a lot of us left by then. Gray, me, and a couple of others. One of them robots got Francine. Mark was wounded. Sent him back to the surface. Then, it was just me and Gray. Whatever happened to Mark? To this day, I don't know. He never made it back here, and... Well, I... Couldn't face the wasteland again, so I... I never looked. What about you and Richard Gray? We made it to some sort of central core, like a plant of some sort. That's when it happened. What? A robot crane crashed into us. Last I saw Gray, he was flying through the air and into some sort of acid bath. I was in bad shape and, well, I passed out. And you never saw Gray again? No, you idiot! I just said I never saw him again, didn't I? Oh, sorry. Well, how did you survive? Well, I have no idea. Woke up in the wasteland, barely hanging on. Got lucky and some traders I knew found me days later. Good thing, since I was already changing. They brought me here and here I've been since. How did you end up becoming a mutant? All I know is it was something inside that base. Do you think it could have been the radiation? How the hell should I know? Gray would have known if anybody could. <sighs> anyway, that's how the deal went down. Wow, Harold. Thanks for the story. Well, thanks for letting me tell it. Well, I'm really here to learn more about a death claw that I've heard about. I also heard that you're the man to talk to. Ooh, that thing. Friend, that is Nightmare City. Why the hell are you asking about that? Gonna kill it. Okay. Well, it's like a damn big man is what it is. Got spikes and claws that can cut through the heaviest armor. But don't let the size fool you. It's quick. Does it have any weaknesses? Well, from what I've heard, maybe whack it in the head. I'd try the eyes. Of course, there's a problem there. What kind of problem? You can't look at them. It is said the Death Claw can hypnotize just by looking. Then it walks up and boom, you're it. Ah, great. Thanks, Harold. Good luck to you. You're going to need it. Well, we walk away not really knowing how much of that we can believe. But Uncle Slappy told us to check in with him after we had finished talking with Harold. Talking with Uncle Slappy, we can say, I talked with Harold. The Death Claw sounds pretty nasty. What can you tell me about it? Death Claw, Death Claw, da da, Death Claw. Come on, what do you know about the Death Claw? Death Claw, scary, real scary. Looks neat though. Wanna see it? You can take me to the Death Claw? Yeah. Death Claw, Death Claw, going to see the Death Claw. Just shut up and take me there! And with that, we arrive at the Death Claw lair, and we gain 800 experience. Heading into the cave, we pass by human bones. We come to a split, and heading south, we find broken eggshells? Examining them, we don't learn anything. But moving south, we find the Death Claw, and he was hunched over some sort of body? 
And as Harold told us, the Death Claw is indeed quick. We're able to get off only one shot before he reaches us and begins to rip us to shreds. Despite how much they talked him up, I only died and had to replay this battle once. Tycho, Ian, Dogmeat, and I were eventually able to take him down. Sadly, on his inventory, we don't find anything. But heading south, we realize that this body is still alive. Urgh, it says. It was so fast. My brothers were gone. Could not help. Who are you, we can ask? I... I am... I can't remember. Was the leader of it... Maybe my hollow disc. The mutant weakly hands us a bloody hollow disc. Before he dies, we can quickly ask him, Where did you come from? We. we were scouting for primes. Came from the northwest. Who sent you? Father. Where are you, Father? Yes, Master. The mutant breathes his last breath and collapses. On his inventory, we find a radio. What was the mutant doing with the radio? When we equip it and try to access it, we find that there is only static on the radio. Perhaps this will only become useful if we get closer to the source of the mutants. Next, we can inspect the hollow disk he gave us. It's labeled Mutant Transmissions, and after downloading it to our Pip Boy, we can read it. We see that it's a transcript. Message sent. Base, this is Scavenger Team 2. Come in. Over. Message received. We're reading you loud and clear. Go ahead, over. We've collected four males, two females, and their supplies from the caravan. They're not too badly contaminated. Tell the lieutenant that we're sending them ahead. They might be able to survive the process. We're going to wait here for a few more days. Message received. Roger that. Were any casualties accrued during the acquisition? Over. Negative. Another clean sweep. Base. Also tell Scavenger Team 1 that we've run across the same problem they had. One of our scouts did not return from his perimeter patrol. A few of our other scouts reported that there was something big and fast seen near our camp last night. I'll be checking it out personally at 0600 hours tomorrow morning. Over. Copy. We'll be waiting for your report. If possible, try to capture it. The master would be very pleased. Over. So it wasn't the water merchants, and it wasn't the Death Claw. It was mutants. The mutants were sacking caravans not just for their supplies, but primarily to kidnap the caravanners. Caravanners whom they say might be able to survive the process. What process are they subjecting these people to? And who is the master? The Death Claw had nothing to do with it. He was attacking the mutants and caravanners indiscriminately. Well, with this evidence in hand, we can return to the Fargo traders and check in with Butch. Well, what do you got for me? It was mutants. What, do I look a crate shy of a load? Did you even see the Death Claw? I'm telling you that it wasn't the Death Claw. All right, so it wasn't the Death Claw. But what with the mutants in Old Town, what with our caravans? Unless it's some kind of conspiracy. You really are stupid, aren't you? You're not listening. What? Get out! I need to tell the committee about this. Go on, get out! The Death Claw? Yeah, been there, saw that, killed it. You... You killed it? Well, I, uh... Um... Uh, where did these mutants come from? I don't know yet, but they mentioned an outpost in the mountains. An outpost? Well, um, well, uh, I'll have to talk to the committee. Yeah, yeah, they'll know what to do. Uh, done and done. G get out, cause uh, I got stuff to do, okay? To complete the quest, we have to check in with Rutger, and we go through a similar conversation with him. We can tell him any number of lies, including that it was the water merchants, but to complete the quest, we have to tell him the truth, and say that actually, it was a group of huge mutants. At first, he doesn't believe me, but we can prove it to him by handing him the holodisc. Upon listening to the mutant transmission, he apologizes for not believing us and gives us 500 hub bucks, then an additional 300 as a tip. 
and from here on out, he welcomes us to go on any of his caravan runs in the future. To take a caravan with the Fargo traders, we have to talk to the caravan driver to the southwest. We learn that the Fargo traders leave on the 8th, the 18th, and the 28th. That's much more common than the twice a month that the Crimson Caravan leave, but sadly the Fargo traders visit fewer locations. They only travel to Lost Hills, the Brotherhood of Steel headquarters, Junktown, and the Los Angeles Boneyard. But their jobs are not quite as dangerous. With the Crimson Caravan, we're guaranteed to always find a fight, but with the Fargo traders, you see that I traveled to Lost Hills without a fight. Though fights are still possible. On the way back, I got stopped by a bunch of mantises. And the Fargo traders don't pay quite as much as the Crimson Caravan, only 400 each way. A net loss of 400 caps compared to the Crimson Caravan. But we don't have time to be fiddling around with these caravans. Running caravans can take weeks or even months, and Vault 13's death clock continues to count down every day. We've only made it to the hub, but we've already wasted 50 days, and we have yet to find the water chip. Back at the hub, our final task is to head to the water merchants on the southern spoke of the hub. It is they whom Rutger said might be able to help us with the water chip. As we arrive, Ian gives us some useful information. This is the office of the water merchants. They're the big movers and shakers of the hub, since they supply the water that keeps everything going. Heading inside, we find the first two rooms empty, but a whole lot of people in the third room. Most of these people are caravanners, however. One says to talk to Martha if we want a job. The other two say, I need a bath. We interrupt Martha in the middle of a conversation. When she sees us, she asks us how she can help. We can ask her if she has a water chip, and she knows exactly what a water chip is, but she says that she doesn't have one. The only place we can find one is inside a vault, though she stops and says, well, maybe you could find one at the Necropolis. The Necropolis? Why would they have one? She says she doesn't know why they would have one, but she guesses they might have one because they never buy any of her water. You see, the water merchants at one time tried to start a caravan route through the Necropolis to trade purified water, but they refused. No one in their right mind refuses water these days, she says, unless they have a reliable supply. She therefore figures that they must have their own purifier, otherwise they would have died out a long time ago. But for an immediate resolution to our vault's problem, she offers to send purified water in a caravan to Vault 13. When we ask her how much it costs, she says that to travel to Vault 13 is going to cost 2,000 caps. If we choose to pay 2,000 caps to have the water merchants send water to our vault, this adds 100 days to our countdown timer. It doesn't solve the problem, but it gives us much more room to work. However, there is a hidden threat in doing so. In order for the water merchants to deliver water to Vault 13, as a consequence, we have to give them the location of our vault. Giving the water merchants the location of our vault has unforeseen consequences later in the game. And so for now, we decline the offer. Now we can also offer our services as a caravan guard to the water merchants. However, the water merchants are the least profitable of all. They leave the most often, however, on the 1st, the 5th, the 10th, the 15th, the 20th and the 25th of each month. But they only go to two locations, the LA Boneyard and Junktown, and they pay the least, only 200 caps each way, giving us a net of 400 caps than the 1,200 we could get by working with the Crimson Caravan. But their route is far and away the safest route. It's possible to travel with them without ever being attacked. So, we just turned down a shipment of purified water to Vault 13. That leaves us with only 100 days to find the water chip. Now, the water merchant speculated that we might find one at the Necropolis, but in the vault location's hollow disk, it told us about a third vault in the area close to Vault 13 called Vault 12. A vault whose greatest marketing strategy before the war was to talk about its wonderful water purification system. Could Vault 12 be near the Necropolis? Well, we learned from the Vault Location's holodisc that Vault 12 lies southeast of Vault 13, beneath the ruins of the sprawling pre-war metropolis of Bakersfield. 
Taking a look at our map and looking southeast, sure enough, we find the necropolis. Could the necropolis be the remains of Bakersfield? If so, could it be hiding the remains of Vault 12? That is our best clue so far. And so we head out into the wasteland, risking our life and the lives of all of our fellow Vault Dwellers in the hope that we're correct and that we're headed towards the remains of Vault 12. We'll find out if this gamble is worth it in our next video on the Necropolis. I publish new Fallout videos each and every week, so if you want to make sure you don't miss that episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a t-shirt shop with unique designs you can't find anywhere else. My designs come in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. They also come on other products as well, smartphone cases, mugs, pillows, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you Tuesday morning bright and early with Episode 7.